All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us here for a new CADA seminar. I'm very pleased today to welcome Kenyon Cho with us. Uh, and I'm also very excited about the work he is going to talk to us about. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank Mark Schmidt very much for giving us this wonderful opportunity to uh, be here together today and uh, learn from all the exciting work Kim Yun Cho is, is, has been doing. He actually has been doing very impactful work, and I've been looking forward to uh, this talk with a lot of interest. Just to give you a quick idea uh, before I get out of your way uh, about uh, Kim Yun. He's an associate professor of computer science and data science at New York University and a CIFAR associate fellow. He was a research scientist at Facebook AI from June 2017 to May 2020 and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Montreal uh, until summer 2015 under the supervision of Professor Joshua Benji. After receiving his PhD and MSc degree from Aalto University, April 2011 and April and April 2014, respectively. Uh, this was under the supervision of Professor Yaha Kartinen and Dr. Tapani Reiko and Dr. Alexander Lin. He tries to, um, of course, this is what he is saying about himself. He tries his best to find a balance among machine learning, natural language processing, and life. And uh, if you are ready for that piece of misinformation, he almost always fails to do so. Uh, I don't agree, but uh, I'll now give the floor uh, to Kyung Yong to talk to us about his research. Uh, the setup would be that we will have um, almost one hour of uh, presentation, and then we'll have like about 15 minutes afterwards to uh, take questions and so on. And uh, you know, you might have some other instructions uh, from our speaker. Uh, I'll let him do that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for the generous introduction, half of which was written by me, but <laughs> so th and uh, thanks for the invitation. I so hope that you know, I was actually in Vancouver, you know, the New York City has been boiling over the past few days and you know, the, it would be nice to see some Pacific, but next time. So today uh, I decided to actually talk about a bit of a potentially a boring topic, but I think is at the heart of the what we have been doing in terms of building a neural network in order to handle sequence data, in particular, the natural language data. And then yeah, I, I put the title as the inconsistencies of a recurrent language model. And in this particular context, context is going to be both mathematical inconsistency as well as some intuitive or the intuitive inconsistency as well. So one thing that I'm not going to talk about is weird to talk about what I'm not going to talk about, but because you know, whenever I give a talk or lecture, a lot of people actually do expect me to talk about, you know, like the latest, you know, Chinese tools that have been developed in the field of natural language processing, in particular machine translation. So I need to give a big disclaimer here. So I'm not going to talk about uh, scale, how to scale up sequence models because it turned out that the, I'm very bad at it while all the other people at Google, OpenAI and so on can do it so much better. I'm not going to talk about better network architectures. Ever since uh, 2014 or so, I've never been able to actually come up with a better neural network than, than anybody else. For instance, you know, the, all these amazing transformers as well as the ResNets are from either Microsoft Research Asia back then or from Google. So we're going to just stick to those things. And I'm not going to talk about the better hyperparameter tuning because it turned out the better hyperparameter tuning can always be done if you have enough compute resources and a very smart hyperparameter tuning algorithm. And also, I'm not going to talk about the how to build a better natural language processing or the sequence modeling systems because those can be done so much better if you're actually solving the actual problems such as the machine translation. So there are a lot of things that I'm not going to talk about today. But what I'm going to talk about is this one glaringly obvious question that I should have asked in 2014 or 2013, in fact, when I moved to Montreal as a postdoc back then. But I kind of forgot to ask. That is, is density estimation a good strategy for neural sequence model? 
And then this is the question that I should have asked back in 2013, but then only after about five, six years, last year, I started to ask this question more seriously. Of course, there's been so many development in the field based around this density estimation for neural sequence modeling. So that was a reason, but of course, the second reason is that the, I was a bit drunk with the, I guess, success of these deep neural networks. And then, you know, forgot to kind of ask these fundamental questions. So let's talk about what I mean by the density estimation for neural sequence modeling. And then to do so, I need to talk about the, what is the common practice in neural sequence modeling. And then this common practice is to model a sequence using a density estimation. And then in this, in this case, learning is done by regularized maximum likelihood. That is, we're going to take a data set that consists of all these sequences often paired with a context, which I'm going to use C to denote. So it's going to be a data set consists of many pairs of C and Y. So in the case of the machine translation, you can think of the C as a source sentence and the Y as the corresponding translation. And then what we're going to do is we're going to train this neural network, which is parameterized using theta, the set of parameters, so that the, this neural net is going to assign as high low probability as possible to the correct translation Y given the source sentence C. And of course, we always do put some kind of regularization there. I'm going to talk about that a bit later. And then once the model is learned, or once this optimization problem has been solved, we are going to use the maximum a posteriori inference of the generation. That is, we now have a machine that is going to assign a probability distribution over all possible translations given a source sentence C. And then what we want to do is we want to find a translation Y that is assigned the high slope probability. So this is what we're doing. And then that's why I call it as the sequence modeling as density estimation. And of course, we've been just following this almost, well, at least I have been following this scheme blind, almost blindly ever since 2013. But then, you know, you start wondering, like, okay, so by doing this kind of sequence modeling as density estimation, what are we actually assuming? Or why is this scheme or the paradigm of sequence modeling as density estimation uh, successful so far? Why has it been successful? And then there are a number of reasons, but at a very high level, there are two factors. In the first aspect of learning, the sequence modeling as density estimation works because the probability assigned to a sequence S that is reasonable is going to be higher than the probability assigned to a sequence S that is unreasonable. We're going to talk about what we mean by a sequence being reasonable a bit later. And then the second aspect that is the inference aspect, what we have been assuming is that the, if we generate or if we solve this maximum a posteriori uh, generation problem, which is often very difficult to solve, so we're going to rely on some kind of approximate solver, let's say G here, then the resulting sequence S is going to be assigned a high enough probability by our model. So if these two conditions are met, then sequence modeling as density estimation is indeed a good way to solve the problem of sequence mode or the sequence generation. But then, <laughs> It turned out that this is, these two assumptions or the conditions are not as easy to check as I thought, or I presume so, nor that the, these conditions are not necessarily met in practice, which I you know, mistakenly thought they would. So let's try to answer some questions. And then I the main question here is that they are reasonable sequences assigned high probabilities by our model. And then in order to answer this question, we need to look at it, trying to look at these questions from two different angles. The first angle is the system level. That is, if I have a setup or the data set of the reasonable sequences, or we can have the distribution, which often we're going to call data distribution, then on expectation, does a better, um, does a better system that is P of theta assign a higher probability than a less reasonable system that is P of theta prime assigns to the set of sequences. So that's a system level. And then the second angle turned out to be the sequence level. When I have two sequences S and S prime, 
And if I knew that S was more reasonable than S prime is, then would my system P of theta assign higher probability to S than the more less reasonable sequence S prime? So we're going to look at both of these angles, but it turned out you can already see that it is you know, simple question. Are reasonable sequences assigned high probabilities? That's just yes, no question. Turned out to be not so easy to answer. So let's look at the system level analysis. And then in this system level analysis, we actually notice that it's not that easy to answer either. So that is, we need to go slightly deeper into the system level analysis. And then as soon as we arrive at this slightly deeper level, we see that there are two different types of analysis here. First one is the intra-family analysis. So where H here refers to the hypothesis set or the space, and then this hypothesis set consists of all possible models that belong to a single family. So if I use a, let's say, deep ResNet, then this H is going to contain all the model param parameters that correspond to this ResNet. And then the question is, within this single family of models, will a model uh, assign, will a better model assign a higher probability to a reasonable sequence? And then the second is the intrafamily analysis. Now, does that, the answer to, does the answer to the intrafamily analysis apply when we're trying to take a look at a pair of exam, uh, models from two different families? Now, the second one is a bit tricky because what it implies is that we need to have drastically different families of models to solve a single problem, in this particular case, the sequence model. That was not possible if you asked me about two years ago because the only thing that we knew how to build well and then were actually deploying in production was the so-called monotonic autoregressive models. And then you, you, know, you probably are already familiar with it, or if not, you probably have heard about how amazing OpenAI GPT-3 is over the past few days on Twitter or whatnot. And then all those models are built based on this paradigm of monotonic order regressive model. I'm going to talk about that a bit later further. And then now, in addition to that, we do have a number of different families of models that we can use to build competitive machine translation system or any kind of sequence generation system. So last year, we learned that we can now build a non-monotonic order regressive model where this model is going to automatically determine the order of dependencies among the variables. When you think about the order regressive models, often what you do is you're going to fix the dependency structures, structure over all those variables we have, and then you're trying to parameterize each and every conditional distributions you get. However, in non-monotonic order regressive model, we actually don't have to determine the order of the variables anymore. We can in fact train a neural net to both determine the order of dependencies or the order of the variables and also to model all those conditional distributions. We also have the so-called mask language model. And then you may have heard about Bert, Roberta, and others. And then those belong to the mask language model. And then it turned out that the Starting from last year, we have learned how to generate from these mask language models as well, which is very highly relevant, uh, connected to the non-monotonic autoregressive models. And then the finally, the final family of models that we have learned recently how to train and then build a competitive sequence generation model is the iterative requirement model or the Latin variable non-autoregressive machine translation model. I'm going to go into the detail of the first and the fourth one because I'm going to compare them with each other in order to do the system level analysis. So let's talk about the monotonic autoregressive model. It's almost a waste of time describing at this point because everyone is using it on their phone without knowing that this kind of mo monotonic autoregressive models have been deployed for various purposes, including the autocomplete, autocorrect, uh, speech recognition, speech synthesis, and machine translation, of course. However, let's try to go through this a little by little in order because you know, this is going to be used in the part two of my talk as well later. So the idea is that we're going to rewrite the probability of, so I use the X, I should use Y, my apologies. So 
I want to rewrite the probability assigned to a sequence X given the input C as the product of the conditional probabilities. And each conditional probability defines a distribution over one of the variables. So in the case of the sequence, it's going to be one of the locations in this sequence. So XT, given the values of the, all the previous locations, so you can think of it as the this conditional distribution tells you what is the reasonable or the likely next word given all the previous words and the source sentence or the context. And then as you can see, this is just a exact way to parameterize the left-hand side that is a P theta of X given C. And then the nice thing about this uh, formulation is that we can use LSTN transform or whatnot in order to model the conditionals on the right-hand side. And then looking at the conditionals, you just notice that the, this is nothing but a classification problem. And then that leads to the regularized maximum likelihood uh, learning, where learning is nothing but trying to build a classifier that takes as the input, the input or the context that is C, concatenated with all the previous words. And then this concatenated input needs to be classified or categorized into one of the possible next words. And then one thing we know how to do these days in machine learning and in particular with this deep neural net is to train a highly, highly capable, uh, let's say, you know, the highly accurate classifiers. And then, you know, we use as much data as we want and then use the stochastic gradient descent. And then you have to be, these kind of, let's say, learning scales up really well. And then we can train an amazing system that is in fact used in production. Google Translate, for instance, uses a neural net that was trained with exactly the formula you're seeing on the slide. And you probably notice that there is no explicit regularization term here because it's often implicitly regularized by using SGD, label smoothing, all the stopping, as well as the dropout in the train. Unfortunate thing about this monotonic auto regressive models is that they, it's easy to train them. We know how to train them but we don't know how to solve the problem of inference or the generation in particular, because we actually introduced all possible dependencies. So dependencies across all possible time lag, and then it becomes simply intractable to solve this problem exactly. If we use the linear parameterization that may have been useful, unfortunately we are not doing that. If the X was continuous, that could have been useful, except that the, in our case, X is a very high dimensional discrete space. And if we assume some kind of Markov, Markovian property, that is the next word is going to depend only on a very small number of the previous words, then we could have used some kind of dynamic programming algorithm. But again, it turned out that there is a pretty horrible uh, assumption you can put if you want to generate a very fluent long sequences or the sentences. So thus, we often resort to using single pass forward only approximate decoding algorithms such as greedy decoding. So let's just think about these two terms first, single pass and forward only. So we are going to start from the beginning of the sentence, so on the target, then we're going to go through it just once until the end of the generated sequence. And then that's why it's single pass and then it's forward only. We never come back. And then this notion is important to keep in your mind because the second part of this talk is going to build upon this notion of using single pass forward only approximate decoding. So in practice, the reason why we use single pass forward only approximate decoding is it seems to work well. It actually does give us a very nice fluent sentences without having to pay for a very expensive computational complexity. In this case, computational complexity is just simply linear with respect to the length of sequence that we want to decode. So monotonic auto regressive models, we have now learned about it. This is the one family of model that we're going to use. Now the second family of model that we're going to use for this analysis is the Latin variable model. Now, when you're trying to do a unsupervised learning or the density estimation in a high dimensional space, there are a number of ways to approach. One is the auto regressive model. So we're going to try to capture all possible dependencies or the dependencies among all possible variables by considering 
uh, let's say, n many conditional distributions. So where the n is going to be the number of variables. Now, on the other hand, what we can do is we can introduce a hidden variables. And those hidden variables or the latent variables are going to capture the dependencies among all those observed variables. And then what we can do is we can marginalize out the latent variables. And then that leads us to this joint distribution or the target distribution that is the p theta of x, x given x, where the dependencies among all those variables in the x are captured to a high degree. So what we do is we introduce the Latin variable. Now, of course, it's not as simple as simply just introducing a set of Latin variables because the data that we are uh, working with is not of the fixed dimension. Every example has its own length or the size. And then what we want is that we actually do want our Latin variables to be of the variable size as well. So what we do is, assuming that the length of the sequence is uh, L, or the, like the bar X, then we are going to introduce a Latin variable whose size is going to be D by the length of the sequence. What that means is that the, it's a very interesting model where the size of the model grows according to the size of the input. And then we're going to make some assumptions one assumption is that the a priori, so that is only given the context, the distribution over this Latin sequence is going to be factorized. So we're going to look at the distribution of the each Latin variable in this Latin sequence independently from each other given the context C. And then the second thing we assume is that the given this Latin sequence configuration Z and the context C, we're going to assume that the input sequence, so the input, uh, the output tokens, so the XTs, all factorize, or that they are independent of each other. So these are some of the assumptions that we're going to introduce. And you know, we also need to model the length, but that's not really important here, so I'm going to skip that detail. But if you're interested in learning more about this Latin variable model for sequences, check out the Shu, Li, Nakayama, and Cho 2020, which was uh, presented earlier this year at AAA. Now, unfortunate thing about this Latin variable model is that it's really difficult to maximize the low probability of the data point directly. Because marginalizing the Latin variables is often intractable. And you know, the, even if we could do so, it requires, it, it requires a very computationally complex, let's say, sampling procedures. So instead, what we do is we maximize the evidence lower bound. That is, we're going to maximize the lower bound to low P of the data points. And then that can be written down in the form that is given there. And then in order to do so, we introduce the three different networks in this case. So we have the prior network that's going to take as the input, the context, and then trying to give you the distribution over the Latin configuration. And then we're going to have a decoder network that's going to look at the context as well as the Latin sequence and then trying to give you the distribution over all possible translations. And in order to be more efficient during training as well as in the test time, we're going to introduce an amortized inference network that's going to take as the input, the correct target and the context to figure out what would have been the correct Latin sequence that would have given a rise to this correct translation. And now suddenly we can actually train this quite easily using SGD, label smoothing, all the tricks and techniques that you have been using for training any of these the neural networks. A nice thing about Latin variable model, as, uh, as opposed to learning them, is that we can actually generate a target translation, not by solving a complicated combinatorial search, but by doing the optimization. In particular, we can actually maximize the evidence lower bound with respect to the target sequence X as well as the Latin variable sequence Z and the length. And then it's still a difficult problem, but it's much more doable and easily uh, check what is happening than solving the combinatorial search without any kind of known structure there. And in particular, we actually use the deterministic inference algorithm by introducing a so-called delta posterior, that is a degenerate posterior. So we look at the entire, the joint space, joint distribution of the Latin sequence as well as the output sequence given the context. And then we try to find the mode 
in this space. And to do so, we introduced this delta posterity. It's a bit of a technical detail that's actually not going to be that important, but yeah, I think let's just go through them quickly. And doing so does resemble the EM-like procedure where we're going to first approximate the approximate posterior using the delta posterior. So that's going to be E step. And then we move on to the M step where we're trying to maximize the elbow, not using the original proximal posterior, but using this delta posterior, the degenerate posterior. And then we go back and forth between these E and M steps. And then ultimately it converges to one point that's going to be one of the modes in this joint distribution. And then what we do see is that it actually works. So just for this Latin variable model, this is the x-axis is the number of inference steps and the y-axis is the blue score that is used to measure the quality of the generation in, in the context of the machine translation. And what we see is that the, as we run this inference procedure, the performance or the generation quality improves. So we now know that the inference can be solved and that is quite efficient. I'm not going to talk about the right panel of this slide, but if you have any questions later, you can ask me about this. So we now have a two model families, monotonic autoregressive model and Latin variable non-autoregressive models. And then for each one of them, of course, there are some details that we need to think about, but those details are not really important in our purpose where we wanted to simply answer the question of whether a better system assigns a higher probability to more reasonable sequences. So we are going to test it empirically using three different data sets, one very small data set on German to English translation, one reasonable size data set that is translating between English and that is not German, but the Romanian. And then the last one is a reasonably large data set that is translating between English and German. Now let's look at intra-family analysis. So we're going to look at each family separately. So we have three families, in fact. We have the monotonic non uh, autoregressive model, and then we have a Latin variable autoregressive model, but within this family, we split it into two by using either the Gaussian prior or the normalizing flow-based prior that's much more sophisticated or complicated than that. And then by looking at individual family, and then individual language pair, because the different language pairs have the different, let's say, uh, input or the translation space, so we cannot really compare them. But by looking at the individual family and individual language pair, we actually have a good news. That is, that the higher log probability does tend to lead to a higher blue score, which measures the quality of the actual generation, so quality of the generation sequence. So looking at, for instance, English-German translation for oral regressive model, we do see a very nice correlation there. And then we do see that for using the Latin variable model with a Gaussian prior, the correlation may not be as stark as the case with the auto regressive model, but we almost always see that kind of uh, correlation. And that is the same uh, case with the Latin variable models with normalizing flow prior as well. So we always see some kind of correlation. So that was the good news. But as soon as we put everything into a single plot, this correlation somehow largely disappeared. So let's look at it again. So the blue axes are point, uh, correspond to the monotonic order regressive model. And then orange cross correspond to the Latin variable model with the Gaussian prior. And then green dot corresponds to the Latin variable with the flow. And then I'm actually showing you all these different languages together Oh, actually, I'm showing you for the one particular language pair, and then you can actually look at what happens. Let's look at the autoregressive model. We do see some kind of correlations, but then you add the correlation is not as high as you want it to be. And if you look at the Gaussian prior case, in fact, we do see sometimes an inverse correlation. That is, a better log probability does not necessarily mean, or in fact, in worse, implies that the quality of the generation sequence is going to get worse. And then the same thing for the flow-based one. And then what we see is that the, weirdly so, when we use the flow, normalizing flow as a plot to model the prior of the Latin variable model, we end up having an amazing density model. But 
that ends up being a horrible sequence generator. On the other hand, autoregressive model seems to hit a sweet spot, although the correlation has dropped quite significantly. So some lessons from this first part, which may have been, must have been quite boring to a lot of you, is that the, although we've been using density modeling, our sequence generation as density modeling paradigm for the past five to six years, and then we even build a production systems that have been deployed all over the world, it turned out that the density modeling and sequence generation are not necessarily correlated in general. They are often correlated given a particular model family and a particular data set, but this often is not enough because this implies that we won't be able to easily jump to the next local minima, minimum with a better model family because we won't be able to easily uh, you know, at the, compare different model families. And then it turned out that the Latin variable models do picture a very interesting, uh, interesting, let's say, view, where the complicated models in terms of the density modeling turned out to be, yes, indeed better at density modeling, but worse at sequence generation. So it was a very interesting exercise that we have done that showed that the there are some corner cases or the corners in this paradigm of the sequence gener modeling as density or sequence generation as the density modeling that where this paradigm somehow breaks down. So uh, it's been about 25 minutes and then you know, I think my first part is done and the second part is going to be a bit more dense than the first part. Is there any questions you can just unmute yourself and ask the question or you can type the question on the uh, group chat. My talk tends to be very clear, leaving almost no room for questions. That's definitely true. I have, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, your guidelines in, uh, in the last slide, they're based on, you show graphs with a few data points. So mm -hmm. uh, what is the statistical significance of this conclusion? Oh, yes, that's a, that's a great question. So where do those, these dots come from? So these dots are in fact coming from running at least five experiments each, and then we are showing the average. And in the paper, we actually do have the uh, standard deviation across the five different runs of the experiments as well, but they tend to be much smaller than the spread we see across the experiments. So surprising thing that we see when we train this large scale neural network on a you know, reasonably sized data is that the, the variance we see in terms of the task loss or the actual, let's say, log loss that we get after training, starting from different random initializations, is not that large. So it's unlike, and that's probably because we are working in a supervised learning setup largely. With the reinforcement learning, I'm like, I never know, you know what they're actually doing with it because of the large variance. But in this supervised learning setting with the established problems, because we do have accumulated all those, let's say, kind of tricks of trade over the past, let's say, several years. So we actually end up getting a good model regardless of where we start our models. Okay, so I was also wondering about multiple languages, other tasks be, be beyond machine translation. That's right. So that's a that's a good question. So we only focus on machine translation in this particular case. But of course, this is not the first time this kind of uh, breakdown of the correlation between the training objective and the actual task objective. So in speech recognition, people have been reporting that in their particular setup. But those setups are slightly incompatible or the difficult to compare against the setup that we are talking about. That is a fully neural sequence model because the speech recognition systems still tend to be a bit hybrid or have, uh, often are used combined together with the external language model. So it makes it a bit difficult to compare. So in a sense that the one of the, one of the many problems where this kind of fully neural sequence modeling has been used and has a large enough data and different types of the families that we can compare it to, it seems like the machine translation is a one nice setup that we want to work with. Thank you.
So before we move on, uh, if there is any questions, oh yep, yeah. okay. Yeah. Did you try any other criteria than blue? Ah yes, so we actually did not in the paper, but we tried some of the human evaluation, and then what we saw was that the, in fact we did see a stark correlation between the human eval and the blue score with these models that we have trained. And then I believe one of the reasons is that these models are not like the state of the art or the amazing models. So what we see in general in machine translation is that the blue scores tend to correlate very well with the human evaluation as long as blue scores are not at the extreme values. So as we get closer and closer to the really the frontier of the machine translation system, we start seeing the breakdown of the correlation between blue and the human evaluation. But all, for all these models that we have tested in this particular paper, the blue scores do correlate very well with the human eval after running some of the experiments. Of course, we didn't uh, run the human eval for every model that we have trained here because there were just too many. Thank you. All right, so then you did, let's move on to the second part. So then, okay, so that was a system level analysis. So after about six years, I, I had learned that the, oh, okay, so the sequence generation as density modeling or density estimation seems not to be the kind of silver bullet. And then we need to study further in what is the right way to train this kind of model in order to get the best generation quality. So that was the lesson we, I learned from the first part. But of course, there is a second part that is just the sequence level analysis. And then in particular, what interested me most was whether we, how well we are doing in terms of finding a good sequence given a already trained model. And then for this purpose, we're going to come back to the autoregressive paradigm. So we're going to forget about the Latin variable model for now, because the autoregressive paradigm is where we have an issue with generation not training. And then also, this is one that is being actually used in practice. So if you remember, I told you, I, I've been kind of abusing the term reasonable, right? So, you know, the probability assigned to a reasonable sequence has to be higher than the probability assigned to unreasonable sequences. But of course, you know, what, what, which sequences are reasonable? We need to define this a bit more carefully, and I'm going to define it in the simplest possible way. And I'm going to simply say that the infinitely long sequences are not reasonable. So I'm not going to distinguish between the finite length sequences, whether, uh, whether one of them is more reasonable than not. But I'm going to simply say that the infinitely long sequences are not reasonable. And I'm going to stick to this definition of the reasonableness. It's very limiting, but it turned out that the, even in this limited uh, definition of the reasonableness, we do observe a very interesting behavior from these neural sequence models. So one weird observation that was made in 2017 by Chen et al, led by the Kevin Knight, who was a professor in USC back then, and who is also now working at Didi Chu Sing now in San Francisco, they made an observation that the, these neural language or the recurrent language models that we build or you, neural sequence model that we build using the monotonic autoregressive paradigm may not be that sensible to start with. Then the funny thing is, you, know, the, you start thinking about, okay, so what is this distribution that is defined by a recurrent neural network or the recurrent language model, either using transform or whatnot, on a sequence? And often, the reason why we prefer this kind of autoregressive model is because once we train a model, this model can be applied to any length sequence, sequence of any length. But then, how, how many such sequences are there, right? So we go back to the, I don't know, like the intro to automata theory or the intro, you know, like the intro to discrete math courses that we all take, we all had taken, you know, when we were in undergrad, junior years, if you, especially if you study computer science. And then you actually realize that the, wait, hold on. There are uncountably many such sequences. 
And you start wondering, wait, hold on, then is it actually the uh, probability that is being uh, probability mass computed by these language models? Or is it a probability density computed by these language models? And then even more so in that particular case, is it possible that these language models in fact assign a non-zero probability to infinitely long sequence? And then this is a really undesirable behavior because one thing we know is because we are working in an actual data science realm is that the, we never observe an infinitely long sequence in natural language. However, what Chen et al. observed is that the, it's very easy to construct a recurrent neural net based language model that's going to assign finite non-zero probability to infinitely long sequences. And then they called it the problem of the inconsistency in a recurrent language model. And then unfortunate thing is that we cannot really decide whether a given recurrent language model is consistent or not. So what that means is that the, we may very well decode from a given language model and then realize that this decoding algorithm is going to never end because it might be finding a infinitely long sequence that has been assigned some non-zero probability. So this doesn't sound good. However, and so, and so we decided to actually look at it a bit more carefully because one thing for sure is that the, no one has actually run greedy decoding on a language model for infinitely long time. At best, there may have been a sum code that is still running that I have forgotten to kill in 2014 or 13 that is still decoding, but that's been only five years. Right? So before moving forward, uh, let's formally define what, what I mean or the, what we mean by recurrent language model. And then recurrent language for that, we're going to use a softmax in order to define a categorical distribution at each time step. So what we do is we're going to go for the order regressive model. And then at each time step, we have a categorical distribution defined by this conditional probability. And then the categorical distributions parameters that are the probabilities for all those categories are computed or given by the softmax, uh, softmax function applied to the output from our underlying neural network. And this underlying neural network is a function of all the previous steps and the current step or the pre uh, current step. And then simply by multiplying all these things, we end up with the probability over a sequence, and then that is what is computed by a recurrent language model. So this is going to be a recurrent language model. One crucial thing that we assume is that the, under a recurrent language model, all these tokens or the variables in different locations must not be independent of each other, given this context. Because as soon as we, uh, you know, like the, any recurrent language model that, uh, results in this independence across all those locations simply means that it's not really a recurrent language model, but a fit for language model or nothing that is so interesting to start. So with this definition of a recurrent language model, which in fact includes all possible language models that you have probably used or have seen the hyped up, let's say, news articles about, they, are, they all belong to this recurrent language model. And then the good news is that they turned out that the, as long as the hidden state, so hidden state from here, hidden state's LP norm is uniformly bounded for some P larger, greater than or equal to one, such a recurrent language model is consistent according to what, how Chen et al. defined the consistency of a recurrent language model in 2017. And the reason why it's a good news is that the, any modern recurrent language model that we use including the uh, LSTM-based language models, as well as the transformer-based language models, do impose by construction that the norm of the hidden state is uniformly bounded. In the case of the transformers, this happens because we use layer normalization. In the case of the gated recurrent unit, as well as LSTM, if this happens because we almost always well, in fact, I'm going to even say that the always, and then we should always use the bounded activation function. And then the reason why this happens is that the, 
what this implies is that the chance of the not terminating, which is defined by putting a producing or the sampling a token that is not the end of sequence token, eventually have to go to one. Wait, eventually have to go to zero. That is that the eventually end of sequence token has to be produced. And then this comes from the fact that the HT is bounded and thereby the so after softmax, the categorical distribution cannot be too picky. So, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. So what this actually implies is that the, unlike what Chen et al. in 2017 demonstrated, the actual modern recurrent language model we use, like GPT-3 or you know, whatever the machine translation systems that Google Translate builds and then deploys, they are all consistent. So there should not be an issue in terms of sequence level analysis that we have been talking about. Because whatever we do, no reasonable se no unreasonable sequence that is infinitely long sequence would receive a non-zero probability. So there should not be a problem. However, it has been observed over many years and was very well demonstrated last year by Holzman et al. from University of Washington that the, we actually do see some weird behaviors. And the Holzman et al. in 2019 coined the term neural text degeneration in order to refer to this phenomenon. That is, you start with a very well-trained language model, such as the OpenAI GPT-2. We should actually retry this with the GPT-3 uh, as well. And then what we're going to do is we're going to give some prompt, prompt text. So in this particular case, which I tried myself using the LN and LPS GPT-2 demo, I gave the World Cup in 2002 was hosted by, and then started to just select the most likely token from the conditional distribution computed by this GPT-2 which is an amazing language model, right? That, is, that used to be the state-of-the-art language model. And then it made a mistake. So that is the factual mistake by saying that it was hosted by the United States. That's fine. I mean, it was hosted jointly by South Korea and Japan. However, that's fine. You know, it's a very likely scenario. And the tournament was held in the United States. And then from there on, it started to go into a weird loop. The tournament was held in the United States and the tournament was held in the United States. The World Cup in 2002 was hosted by the United States and the tournament was held in the United States. The World Cup in 2002 was hosted by the United States and the tournament was held in the United States. And it just kept on going. And then without actually breaking out of this loop, but it was self-reinforcing and then making this loop more and more likely. And then this is really weird, right? So we are trying to maximize the joint probability of a sequence by selecting the token used at, for each of the conditional distribution to maximize the conditional probability. And then from a language model that cannot assign non-zero probability to an unreasonable sequence that is infinitely long. But somehow when we do the greedy decoding, of course, it's undecidable, so I cannot really check it myself, but it looks like it is going into a loop, and then it is in fact generating an infinitely long sequence, or it is about. So what is going on there? Somehow we have a consistent recurrent language model that is extremely well trained, in fact trained on a data that does not have any infinitely long sequence, even if we concatenate everything. It's never going to be infinitely long. But somehow, when we use greedy decoding, we were decoding an infinitely long sequence. And then the sequence should receive the probability of zero by our analysis earlier and then what Chen et al. showed in 2017. So what is going on there? So in order to you know, do some more analysis, let's define something called incomplete decoding. So as we talked about at the very beginning, we, because the inference or the generation is intractable with this kind of monotonic autoregressive model, we use single pass forward only approximate decoding such as greedy decoding. And then we characterize this family of algorithms as incomplete in a sense that the, at every time step, such a 
single pass forward only approximate decoding algorithm will only use a small subset or a strict subset of the all possible options available at each time step. And then we're going to use Q to, to denote the induced distribution or the induced conditional distribution by a decoding algorithm F. So this is incomplete decoding. And then almost always we use incomplete decoding because the ancestral sampling, which is complete decoding, does gives us a very ill-formed sentences quite often. It's just a very large space. And then our distributions support this the entire space. So when we sample from it simply, then we do get a lot of, let's say, un, not unreasonable, I shouldn't say that because I have defined what reasonable is, um, some ill-formed sentences quite often. So we always go for the incomplete decoding and then we reduce the search space by reducing or the considering only a strict subset of possible values that can be taken at each time step. And then this incomplete decoding includes top K sampling, so looking only at the top K tokens at each time step, top P sampling, looking only at the top tokens of which the probabilities sum to at least P or greedy decoding or even beam search, except for the ancestral sampling. Now, let's just talk quickly about the implication of such incomplete decoding. Is that the incomplete decoding algorithms work in two stages always. At each time step, it's going to filter out presumably unreasonable tokens or the ill-formed or the, you know, the bad choices. And then among the filtered in, so the good tokens, this incomplete decoding is choose one of them either according to probabilities or whatever the criterion that was given or the computer based on what the underlying recurrent language model computes. And then what you notice about the first stage is that the, it only depends on the rank of the token, not its probability. Of course, the rank is determined using the probability, but the rank does not actually incorporate the magnitude information. And then the first stage does not look at the actual probabilities, but only the rank induced by them. And then what matters in this case is the rank of this special token end of sequence that marks whether the generated sequence should terminate or the decoding algorithm should terminate or not. So that is, we don't really care about the probability assigned to the end of sequence given all the previous tokens and context by this recurrent language model we have, but we care about in this sorted list of all possible tokens from this vocabulary at this time step where this end of sequence token is, uh, is placed. If this end of sequence token is never included in this filtered in subset, the V prime induced by the decoding algorithm, then any incomplete decoding algorithm would never terminate. And then now, based on this idea, we can now define the consistency, not of a recurrent language model, but of the decoding algorithm itself. That is, a decoding algorithm F is consistent with respect to a consistent recurrent language model P theta under some context distribution P of C. This one is actually not necessary, so you can forget about this for now if the decoding algorithm F preserves, preserves the consistency of model P theta. That is, probability assigned to infinitely long sequence under the induced distribution of the decoding algorithm is also zero, then we call this decoding algorithm consistent. What that means is that the, in a layman's term, if I use this decoding algorithm F, on a, any consistent recurrent language model, this algorithm must terminate and returns a sequence of finite length. Because as soon as it gives me a sequence of infinite length or the never terminates, that implies that in this distribution induced by the recurrent uh, decoding algorithm, the infinitely long sequence, there exists an infinitely long sequence that, that is assigned a positive probability. 
And it turned out that the, uh, is the story is a bit sad because an incomplete decoding algorithm is inconsistent because we can construct quite easily in hindsight a consistent recurrent language model that's going to put the end of sequence token at every time step at the very end of this sorted list of the tokens in a vocabulary. And then yeah, it's relatively straightforward to construct this while satisfying all those assumptions or the conditions that we have defined in order to precisely define or formalize a recurrent language model that is interest. So I'll just skip this part, although it's not too difficult to go through. And then what that means is that the, there is a case where even with the consistent recurrent language model, using greedy decoding or any of these incomplete decoding algorithm, we might end up decoding out a sequence that receives a zero probability, and that is the unreasonable sequence. So can we actually fix this? It turned out that there are a number of quick fixes that we can try. So I'm going to go through them quite quickly because they are not really that important, but it looks like there is a fundamental issue that we need to fix. First thing is that the, we actually get motivated, we are inspired by the theory, and then we just ensure that the end of sequence token is always going to be included or eventually is going to be included in B, B prime, the filter subset. So one way is to ensure that they rebuild sampling algorithms that are consistent. And then how we do it is quite simple. Instead of taking only the top K tokens, but we're going to always take top K plus one tokens, where token where the last one is always going to be end of sequence. So that makes it easy. Of course, this is not easy to ensure for the deterministic algorithm because in, even in that case, if the deterministic algorithm simply says that, yeah, I'm going to only choose the very top one, then including EOS at the very end of this filter DIN subset doesn't really help. So another way is to re-parameterize the whole softmax that we use for the recurrent language model so that the probability assigned to end of sequence token is going to grow monotonically. And then we can quite easily do so by ensuring, except uh, parameterizing the probability of the end of sequence token separately from all the other tokens. And then it's easy to show that because we are going to monotonically increase the probability of the end of sequence token over time, eventually its, it's probability it has to be larger than the probabilities of any other tokens. And then any deterministic algorithm that is incomplete algorithm is going to choose that in order to, uh, in order to terminate and then return the sequence. So of course, you know, those are the quick fixes that I think are still fundamentally flawed. But of course, the first question we need to ask is that the does this inconsistency actually happen? Does it actually happen? Of course, we, we have some anecdotal examples where we tried ourselves using those kind of web demo, and then we do see that it goes into the loop, but does it actually happen? And then can we check this systematically? So we train the hyperbolic tangent recurrent neural net as well as the LSTM on a Wikitex 103 data set. And then of course, we cannot de decide whether such an, some algorithm is going to terminate or not because you know, that's going to be solving the whole thing problem. So instead we define it as, uh, define the uh, non-termination as not outputting the end of sequence symbol within let's say some reasonable number of steps. That is a some multiplication of the maximum length of the sequence that you see in the training set. Because the uh, neural net, this neural net should not put high probability on sequences that are substantially longer than the longest sentences in the data set. It turned out that the, indeed this kind of non-termination happens and it does happen across board. It happens for the simple RNN, it happens for the LSTM, it happens with the greedy decoding, it happens with the beam search, it happens with the nuclear sampling, everything except for the ancestral sampling as determined or the predicted by our theory. And then, of course, we want to plug in this kind of consistent sampler or the variant. And then this consistent sampler 
quite clearly because you know, they, they are supposed to do so, solve this issue with the inconsistency in terms of ensuring that the samplers are going to always terminate. However, unfortunate thing we have noticed, as you see in the third example here, the termination does not necessarily happen in a reasonable place. It might simply terminate at some point because anyway, the probability of EOS grows monotonically. And this is just you know, the, beyond the sam uh, examples, but just showing you that the, it always terminates with this kind of consistent variant. And then we also try the self-termination. And then what we see is that the self-terminating algorithms, so for instance, if you look at the STL-STM here, self-termination algorithms almost always terminate. So results in making greedy decoding or the beam search always terminate. However, at the expense of worse perplexity, that is the worst predictability. So the accuracy gets worse. So what that implies is that the, it seems like the solutions that we have found, the quick fixes that we have found, turn, uh, make sure that the decoding algorithms are going to become in, uh, consistent by crippling the underlying recurrent language model or the crippling the decoding algorithm itself. That's why I'm saying that it's not really the D fix. However, it does actually tell us that the looking at this theory turned out to be very useful because it does predict what's going to happen and then does give us an insight into what is the right direction toward which we pursue in order to build a better system. So you see some of these effects and then again, they always terminate. However, sometimes it terminates well, but sometimes it just terminates in the random place. So some lessons from the second part is that the, well, a good realization is that a typical recurrent language model is already well designed to be consistent a la channel 2017. A bad news is that the, our use of this incomplete decoding turned out to be theoretically and empirically inconsistent because it actually leads to generating a zero probability sequence that is the infinitely long sequence, which we defined as unreasonable. And then I am, you know, like this, it's rare for me because I'm a pretty empirical person with the, you know, the engineering kind of background. Well, you know, I have learned yet again that the theory actually, and the theory and mathematics sometimes help. And then in this particular case, I actually learned a lot by just looking at the problem, not from the empirical point of view, but also from the theoretical point of view. We were able to come up with the quick fixes in terms of the parameterization of the recurrent language model as well as the inference algorithm. However, I do believe that the fundamentally correct way to solve this problem is to solve it via coming up with a better learning algorithm, which we haven't been able to do so yet. So let me just summarize my talk. Sorry, I'm going over the uh, time, the allocated time. So, you know, like the, it has been always a big question that I should have asked or the whole community should have asked earlier is that the, is density estimation a good strategy for neural sequence model? So far, the indication is that the, is largely, the answer is largely yes. However, with some now known and confirmed caveats. First is that the, this relationship between low probabilities and generation quality seems to be not perfect, perfect, across board. It's some often not comparable across model families and even the training regimes. The second caveat is that a approximate inference algorithm that we use, these incomplete decoding algorithms, seems to be amazingly good at finding a weakness in a well-trained density estimation. That is, by generating a sequence that, has, that is assigned a zero probability by our density estimation. So now, you know, the, what is the things that we need to do further? And, you know, the, unfortunately, I haven't been able to make any progress in this direction. However, I think that we as the community should make progress in this direction, or at least put some effort. First is that we, I believe that we need to characterize a gap between density estimation and sequence modeling much better, both theoretically and empirically. And then in particular, I'd love to, I'd like to point you to a very nice paper from Felix Stolberg and Bill Byrne from Oxford from last year's EMNLP, where they show the other extreme case where they demonstrated the recurrent language model trained with a maximum likelihood decimation somehow puts a huge amount of probability mass on zero length sequence. 
And then this is the opposite of what I was talking about, right? I just told you that this incomplete decoding algorithm finds infinitely long sequence that is assigned zero probability, but at the same time, this recurrent language model had a weird pathology where it was assigning huge amount of probability mass to zero length sequence. So Felix and I joked about it at some point, saying that the, we as a whole community got extremely lucky. It, our algorithms or the, our systems work, work, have probably worked because we were using a decoding algorithm that favors infinitely long sequences on a model that favors zero length sequence. And then somehow they canceled each other and allowed us to find a reasonable length good sequence. And the second direction that I think is really important, which I'm just re-emphasizing, is that we need to find a better learning algorithm to this narrow this gap significantly and more explicitly. And I believe that the generally the learning algorithm needs to be aware of the generation, however, without having to incur significant computation complexity. There are many inference aware learning algorithms. If you're interested in some of them, try to look at the uh, Sean's pa Sean Willock's paper, my PhD student's paper that was put on archive recently, not because of the algorithm we proposed there, but because of the related work there. So all those are learning algorithms are there, but so far we haven't been able to use those algorithms to build a better practical system than simply scaling up these models and data set with the computationally advantageous algorithm of the maximum likelihood destination. So that actually concludes my potential, probably boring, I'm sorry about this, but this is very fascinating questions that I've been answering. Boring talk, uh, and you know, if you have any questions, I'll be around for another 10 minutes or so in order to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, I guess we are uh, ready to take some questions, uh, like a really, really enlightening talk. Um, and I imagine people have questions, so please you can so go ahead I and see unmute the, yourself. Yeah, uh, Michelle, I think that you have your hand raised. Oh yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, great. I really enjoyed the talk. The, the natural language process NLP is not my area, but uh, I, the talk made a whole lot of sense. Um, yeah. So fantastic talk. The uh, I was wondering about like are, are these zero length and infinite length cases really any worse than than other kind of uh, uh, worst case worst case uh, um, sequences that you might produce right so so, so maybe okay they're, they're kind of interesting as curiosities but are, are there really any worse than than anything else the model might produce and and so so maybe just trying to do like a some kind of a, a, a bounds on the worst case is is just as informative for as to just chasing after the, these these specific cases any thoughts on that Right, so that's actually a really good question because we do see a lot of pathologists that are not, neither you know, at the zero length or the infinite length sequences in these sequence generation models. But one thing that we have, been, have not been able to do so is to characterize those pathologies. So for instance, one particular pathology that we see over and over, and then you can actually check it with the Google Translate yourself, is that the, when sometimes it just generates a sequence that has nothing to do with a context, although it is extremely fluent. But then what is the right way to characterize it? Turned out to be difficult because if we could characterize it perfectly, that actually solves the problem of generating a correct sequence as well. So we have been looking at these extreme but easy to characterize uh, cases. And then one of the reasons why we've been looking at this particular case is that the, at some point we realized that the, at least I realized that the, I've been trying to improve the uh, performance of these inference algorithms in a rather blindfolded way. And then I think that I'm worried that some of the steps that I took myself as well as the community took may have actually led to these pathologies that should be obvious and should have actually been characterized and avoided from the beginning. But in general, I agree with you, yes. We need to, we now know that the, even these simple pathologies are useful and provide a nice insight into designing new algorithms we need to go further and then try to characterize even more pathologies. Yeah, yeah, no, true enough, true enough. And, and, and so, so, so wi uh, wider beam search, et cetera, that, that, that doesn't address the, these problems, right? So the interesting thing is that the wider beam search addresses the issue that I talked about, but wider beam search, in fact, 
falls a victim to the issue that was pointed out by Felix Starberg and Bill Brown. That is that they, they tend to find the sequences of increasingly short of length. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, lovely talk. Thank you. I have a question about uh, increasing the probability of end of sentence. Okay. So this totally makes sense. I mean, we also as humans, as we were speaking, we wait for the end of a sentence. And as the sentence gets longer and longer, we expect it to be finished sooner. So that mm -hmm. makes total sense. However, um, what I'm afraid of is that there is no correlation between choosing the words before end of sentence and the end of sentence. So by just increasing the probability of end of sentence, as you showed, we might end the sentence biasly in a random place without the mm. sentence being finished. So is there anything that you can think uh, can help in that regard? Yeah, so that's an that's amazing observation you made just by looking at these slides is that the, in fact, that is precisely the issue why the self-terminating recurrent neural nets are not used. And then the why I don't use it myself as well is that the, it tends to increase the probability of the end of sequence too quickly. So if you see from the, uh, the slide on the screen, how we parameterize this whole thing is that we're trying to parameterize this alpha of HT, which should talk about the probability of not end of sequence. And then we try to make it decrease monotonically. And then we look at the one minus of that in order to ensure that the probability of end of sequence is going to be monotonically increasing. And then the interesting thing is that the, there is a part of this parameterization that allows the neural net to change the rate at which the end of sequence probability increases. However, what we have found is that the, these neural nets are just not powerful enough. I know this is not the thing that you know, I, I usually say is that but the, this neural net is not powerful enough to really make the end of sequence probability flat until the desired point shows up. It turned out they just cannot do it. And these neural nets are too smooth, it turned out. So I don't know at the moment what is the right direction to go. One direction that I've been thinking without much success is that the, what if we're trying to avoid this kind of multiplicative uh, parameterization, but for the end of sequence token, be more lenient and then say that, okay, we're going to follow some kind of uh, additive parameterization of the probability of end of sequence while all the others are going to be parameterized using the multiplicative um, you know, updates. I don't know what is the right answer to that, but this is a great observation. And then this probably implies that the, even in terms of building a neural net itself, so how, that is how to parameterize these conditional probabilities, there is a long way to go. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Uh, hi, so thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about, uh, again, maybe the generality of, the, of your findings. So, so you have been focusing on like sequences of words, I guess. So I'm, I'm wondering how these uh, results might be applied to sequences of other elements in language like characters or sentences and maybe sequences of other elements in other domains. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. In, in fact, I didn't go too much into the details of the experiments, but most of the, for most of these experiments, we actually tested uh, two cases, whether uh, either, you know, do we model, it, model a sentence as a sequence of words or, you know, model it as a sequence of the sub word tokens that were automatically induced from the data. And then generally, whatever I have presented today should apply to any sequence of discrete tokens. So the, the question actually I have more, more about the applicability is what would happen if we have a sequence of the continuous variables? And what I can see is that, of course, we can think about doing some kind of quantization. And then once the quantization is, or the discretization is done, you know, we, of course, everything is going to apply equally. But the thing is that the, this quantization will have to be adaptive because you know, we're given data. In that case, 
does the does whatever I have presented today apply to apply there as well? So that's a big question. But generally, as long as the data is of a sequence of discrete tokens, even just a binary sequence, the all the results that I have presented you today apply. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. I think we are hitting uh, the fifteen uh, minute uh, uh, cap here. Although I, I'm sure that people uh, probably have more questions, uh, but you know I would like to very much thank you again uh, for this wonderful talk. I think it's very informative, and uh, you know I, I myself have some questions, but I, I'm, I guess I'm going to su suppress them for the time being. You can always like, email me, of course. Yes. yes, of course, and I assume like other people can also email you. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, thanks. And uh, I'd like to thank Erin. And I don't know if Erin has any announcement for people before we uh, just say goodbye. Uh, no, no announcements. Thanks everyone for coming and thank you for joining us. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for the great. invitation and bye bye yes. everyone. Yes, thanks. Next time we'll hope you will be with us here in Vancouver. Definitely, okay. yes. Yeah. Bye -bye. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you very much.